Namaskar and welcome to this lecture on concrete engineering and technology. This course that we are having on the subject of concrete engineering seeks to revise principles of concrete science and engineering as we have learned them in an earlier course perhaps. Developing a framework which helps us understand the present day scenario in concrete engineering and go through some special issues in special or high performance concretes and their quality control from the point of view primarily of uh, performance based thinking, durability and maintenance of concrete structures. Now, this is something which we have seen earlier is an outline of the course, what is going to be done or what is being done in the course. We have gone through this as well, we have defined normal concrete and now we are trying to study some special concretes, where mineral admixtures and chemical admixtures are an integral part. This is our traditional concrete, where we have a normal slice, which is modeled as made up of coarse aggregates, fine aggregates, cement and water and of course, some amount of air in the system, which if it is pooled at one place or lumped at one place as far as the volume is concerned, gives rise to a figure which is something like this, where gravel and sand and cement and water, perhaps mineral admixtures like uh, fly ash and so on, all get lumped into one place and we have a volumetric balance, where the absolute volumes of all these components add to a certain volume, which we normally take to be about a thousand liters or a cubic meter. That is what we take for proportioning of concrete mixes. Now, this is the definition of paste, mortar and concrete and we have seen the reason for changing them or modifying them, where we say that it is not only cement, but other materials which have a fineness close to that of cement may also be considered part of the paste as far as the properties of fresh concrete are concerned in some form, even though those other mineral admixtures may or may not contribute as effectively as cement as far as the strength development is concerned. Similarly, as far as sand is concerned, we would like to reiterate that there can be other material such as ground uh, copper slag and so on, which can be used as partial replacement of natural sand. The idea basically being that the properties of that material should be as close or should be close enough to that of natural sand or normal sand as it is used in ordinary concrete constructions. In fact, the similar statement can be made as far as coarse aggregate is concerned, because uh, there is always a possibility that somebody would like to use recycled aggregate and so on as coarse aggregate and therefore, that helps us reduce the quantity of naturally occurring coarse aggregate or rock or sometimes use concrete or make concrete only with artificial coarse aggregates. So, this definitions which we reiterated or which we stated at the beginning of the course in terms of normal concrete construction is the one that is now under review when we are talking of special concretes. And we have talked about self consolidating concretes and we have seen how some of these new materials or mineral admixtures are used and their addition how it affects or impacts the properties of concrete. Now, continuing from there we get back to our discussion on special concretes, where we are interested to take a look at how a concrete becomes a special in terms of materials and proportioning, in terms of the mixing method, the transportation method, the placing method or the kind of vibration which is carried out, the kind of curing which is carried out and so on. So, we have basically stated that for all these processes there is a certain normal range of operation and anything beyond that is something which will make the concrete or the concreting operation as special. So, we have seen that kind of a thing happening in the case of self consolidating concrete and we also discussed this matter when we are talking about high performance concretes. Now, today we are continuing our discussion. Now, these are some of the special concretes or the concreting operations that we have talked about use of self compacting concrete, fiber reinforced concrete, mass concrete, 
underwater concrete, roller compacted concrete and short crete. So, these are some of the examples which can be considered as special concretes or concreting operations. Now, in our discussion today we will talk largely of fiber reinforced concrete having completed some kind of a discussion on self compacting concretes earlier. Now, fiber reinforced concrete or FRC is used to increase the tensile strength and toughness of concrete. We will talk of these properties and their exact definitions as we go along in the discussion today. This concrete or the FRC involves the use of short discrete randomly distributed fibers within the concrete matrix. So, these short discrete randomly distributed fibers are an integral part of the fresh concrete and when the concrete is placed these fibers are placed along with it. It is different from the classical reinforcement of concrete where the steel bars are placed separately and the concrete is poured around it. In the case of fiber reinforced concrete as we will talk about today these short fibers are part of the concrete. The traditional reinforcing bars or the reinforcement may or may not be there in the concrete structure depending on the particular application that we are talking about. As far as the applications are concerned we will see them later on in this discussion. Fiber reinforced concrete finds applications in short creeds, slabs, precast concrete products and also repair works to avoid spalling of concrete from repaired structures. Now, how the presence of these small or short discrete fibers helps as far as the properties of concrete and for example, what is mentioned here is in terms of avoiding spalling or falling off of the concrete in the case of repaired structures. How that really happens is something which we need to talk about and we will do that in our discussion today. Now, once again let us take a look at the slice of concrete and in addition to the coarse aggregate and the mortar and so on which is present in a normal concrete. We also have the presence of short random fibers as part of this matrix in a fiber reinforced concrete. This here is a picture of the face of a prism with fibers in the concrete matrix. So, we can see these small fibers sticking out of the concrete and if we see these three pictures here we see that these concrete prisms have been loaded and we have large crack widths at one end and in spite of these large cracks the specimen or the prism has not completely collapsed. If we test a normal concrete prism much as what we do in the case of determining the flexural strength of concrete for example, we are testing it like this. What we would normally get is at a very small deformation here this would just break into two parts much like what happens when we apply a load on a chalk. So, it completely disintegrates this does not happen in the case of a fiber reinforced material or a composite and it can sustain large degrees of deformation or cracks at the bottom. In fact, one of the measures that some of you would like to know In fact, this is an exaggerated version of how a fiber reinforced concrete prism would behave when it is loaded in flexure. So, in spite of these large cracks being formed here because of the presence of these fibers the specimen does not completely collapse. So, continuing with our discussion as far as fiber reinforced concretes are concerned it can be considered to be a composite material made of traditional concrete or normal concrete 
which is mixed with short discrete randomly distributed fibers and there is a meaning to each of these words short discrete and randomly distributed. The fibers as we will see later on are basically short, they are discrete that is the fibers do not lump together, they do not behave as a group together and so on and they are randomly distributed that is in all the three directions. We do not take any special care or we do not use a method by which we seek to orient the fibers in a particular direction or two directions and so on. So, if we do that, that is also possible, but in our discussion today we will confine ourselves to a situation where the fibers are randomly distributed and we have not taken any measures in order to control the direction in which the fibers are oriented, because it is really the direction of these fibers which controls or governs or determines the property of concrete in that particular direction. For example, in this matrix, if all the fibers were oriented in this direction, then there is no way that this can be sustained, because there is no reinforcement that is happening in this direction. So, we must make an assumption and that is what we will do. And therefore, for normal concretes or normal fiber reinforced concretes, we will make an assumption that all the fibers that are present in the matrix are distributed in all the three directions. Now, the fibers present in the matrix are used within concrete to improve the crack propagation characteristics of the basically brittle concrete matrix. As we have seen earlier, a concrete matrix is brittle and upon application of flexural load, the bottom which is subjected to tensile strains collapses. This is what is prevented by the presence of small fibers across the crack faces and gives us better properties in the post cracking phase. Now, as far as the properties of the fiber reinforced concrete are concerned, they are governed obviously by the properties of the concrete itself, which is governed in turn by the water cement ratio, the maximum size of the aggregates, the amount of sand used and so on and so forth and then the properties of the fibers and the properties of the fibers are related to what material we use as far as the fiber is concerned. It could be steel, glass, carbon, polyethylene and so on. The shape of the fiber indented, crimped, plain, the size which is the length and the diameter of the fiber, the total content which is usually expressed in terms of volume and orientation and dispersion. So, these are the kind of parameters based on which we can estimate or determine the properties of a fiber reinforced concrete. This here is a diagrammatic representation of matrix concrete and fibers. So, in this picture here we are showing continuous fibers. So, the fibers are long and continuous and oriented in a certain direction and we have concrete matrix surrounding it. Whereas, in this case we have short discrete fibers which are randomly oriented and we are talking of this particular picture as fiber reinforced concrete as we shall talk about today. Now, small introduction to the theory of strength of brittle materials, we will not go into too much detail on this. The Griffiths theory tells us that the tensile strength it is basically related to the size of the defects which are present within the material which is C and of course, E and gamma which are the constants. So, as far as concrete is concerned it has a low tensile strength due to the existence of a large amount of cracks in the matrix. So, the concrete itself is brittle because we have a very large value of C that is the defects in concrete are many and very large. And now, if we are able to reduce the size of cracks within the concrete, the tensile strength can be increased. Now, if that is not possible, we try to bridge the cracks or these defects and that is the approach which is adopted in the case of design 
and use of fiber reinforced concretes. This here is a clearer picture of what I was trying to tell you that when it comes to fibers and concrete being put together this here is the defect which will cause the concrete to have very low tensile strength. If we bridge this crack with the fibers that are shown here, then the effect of this crack or defect will be reduced to a large extent. If we are able to reduce the spacing of these fibers by adding more fibers, then we get a more effective control or a more effective addition to address the problems that might arise out of this defect and we get more and more tensile strength. Of course, there is a limit to which it can be really improved. Now, if you look at this picture here, it shows fibers, the coarse aggregate and the voids. So, obviously, it is not possible that the fibers will always cross these defects. But one thing we should understand or try to remember from this picture is that the voids and micro cracks serve as the crack initiators that is one. The presence of fibers prevents crack elongation and increase of crack width and increase in strength by the fiber spacing. Another thing which we must understand or try to look at this picture and draw the conclusion is the following. Whether or not the addition of fibers is effective in terms of controlling or addressing this problem on account of internally present defects would also depend on the relative size of these fibers in relation to the size of the coarse aggregate. If we use very small fibers and large aggregates, it is not likely that we will get a large improvement in terms of the tensile strength of concrete. And at the same time, if we use very large fibers or very long fibers, there are other problems that are associated with that. And we shall see something related to that as we go along in this presentation. So, all things considered, the fiber length of at least 1.5 times the maximum size of aggregates, considering the ease of fiber dispersion is one guideline that we can use. While a fiber length of 30 mm or more is generally recommended and that is basically addressing the fact that for a lot of concrete construction, the maximum size of aggregate used is in the neighborhood of about 20 mm. So, 30 mm is a ballpark number which basically says that as far as normal concrete construction is concerned, fibers which have a length of about 30 mm are good enough as far as their use is concerned in fiber reinforced concretes. Fibers of about 60 mm length with a reinfo with reinforcing effect are used in slabs. So, we can use larger fibers, but 30 mm is recommended. If we use 60 mm, the reinforcing effect is higher. The reinforcing effect of fibers essentially depends on the length of the fiber, and that is something which we will talk about a little later. Here are some examples on pictures of fibers, steel, polyethylene and so on. This is a normal slice of concrete or a slice of normal concrete with coarse aggregates embedded in the mortar matrix and that is what we have been seeing in some of our pictures. Now, these are some of the fibers which are used as far as short fibers are concerned in fiber reinforced concretes. Now, these two are steel fibers, this is a glass fiber and this is a polyethylene fiber. So, you can see that these two steel fibers, this fiber here for example, is this fiber here for example, is a crimped that is it has a shape which is something like this. Compared to that, these fibers are straight even though if we look closely there are deformations on the surface to increase the bond strength. Similarly, 
if we look at the glass fibers, these are extremely short. Just for by way of illustration, they are very short, they are very small and these are glass fibers, which for illustration have been taken as very small, very short and we can imagine that the reinforcing effect of these glass fibers as far as a concrete matrix like some like this could be very small. These here are polyethylene fibers, which are very small in diameter. The aspect ratios and so on can be obviously calculated depending on the length and the diameter of these fibers. This is an illustration of how fibers tend to form and group as a ball when they are mixed with concrete. So, if we do not take special measures of ensuring that this ball is broken and individual fibers are actually dispersed within the concrete matrix, the effectiveness of fibers is very small, fibers that we use in fiber reinforced concrete and this length is related to the maximum size of the aggregate. So, I will leave it to your intuition to understand how that aspect ratio is a very important characteristic in determining whether or not a fiber will be effective in terms of its ability to contribute to the tensile strength of concrete is concerned. This here is a simplified model for fiber reinforcement. If we have a fiber which is embedded in concrete the way it is shown here, half the fiber that is L by 2 is embedded in concrete, half of it is sticking out and a force T is applied to pull this fiber out. This is resisted by the development of bond of friction within the concrete and that is to the extent of the surface area and the length of embedment. Now, there are three possible modes of failure. Fiber fails in tension that is the force is such that the embedment is very strong but the fiber gets ruptured here. So, that is the fiber in tension. Then it can fail by way of interface in bond that is this bond here is not sufficient and the fiber gets pulled out from the concrete. So, this is close to a pull out of the fiber and then there is the possibility of the concrete itself failing. That is the fiber is very strong, the bond is very strong and by pulling this out it causes failure along the concrete or it causes failure within concrete itself. This is something which is very common which we see in a garden for example. Let us try to understand this with an analogy which we see in a garden. If we have a small blade of grass which is embedded in the soil and we try to pull it out. One thing that can happen is that the blade fails that is we have a failure here. The second thing that can happen is that the blade is pulled out that is this part gets pulled out. The third thing that can happen is that the soil fails and that is what happens when we get this whole amount of soil coming out of the ground along with this blade. So, precisely this is what is going on when we are having a fiber embedded in concrete either the fiber fails in tension or in the at the interface with the concrete or it causes failure in the concrete itself. Now, let us try to look at a simplified equation where this force T is equal to sigma times pi d square by 4 which is the diameter which is the cross sectional area of the fiber and this has to be compared with the pi d which is the circumference times the length of embedment 
and the bond strength which is developed. So, once we do that kind of analysis we see that L by D critical and that is the aspect ratio is really related to the properties like this which is the sigma which is the tensile strength of the fiber and tau which is the bond strength for that particular fiber. So, it is the bond strength. So, it is the aspect ratio which is related to the maximum tensile and the bond stresses and that is how it is the importance of and that is what is the importance of the L by D parameter. This here is a picture which shows the testing of fiber reinforced concretes in a laboratory and we can see how these fibers which are embedded on two sides of a concrete specimen and there is a perspex plate which separates these two fibers. If they are pulled apart we are basically trying to induce the failure here either the fiber failure or the pull out and so on and so forth. In fact, this gives rise to the discussion in terms of what is the property which is required of the fiber and that is something which we have seen when we saw the fibers that not all fibers are really smooth. Some of these fibers have some kind of crimping. So, the fiber really looks like this or sometimes the fiber looks like this. So, these ends provide more bond strength or more anchorage to each of these fibers as they are pulled out or as they are acted upon by loads that may act on concrete. This here is the test which we have seen for flexural strength of concrete and that is what we were trying to show that if these kind of tests are carried out normal concrete specimens would show very brittle behavior when it comes to failures at these points is concerned, which is not going to happen when we are talking in terms of a fiber reinforced concrete. This here is the load deflection diagram as obtained from a test like this. So, if we compare this, so if you look at these closely as far as non reinforced concrete or normal concrete is concerned beyond a certain point there is virtually nothing that can beyond a certain point there is virtual collapse. The concrete is simply not able to take any more load. Whereas, in the case of fiber reinforced concretes which is this line as well as this line depending on how much is the fiber, what is the kind of fiber and so on the concrete could be a low ductile concrete or a highly ductile concrete a low ductile concrete or a low ductility concrete would be a concrete which has fibers which give it some kind of a residual strength or a residual post cracking load carrying capacity. But in a case of a highly ductile concrete this ability is much larger. So, there is a lot more load that can be sustained even in the post peak region. In the case of low ductile concretes the amount of load that can be sustained is much smaller compared to the peak load. We must remember this schematic or a qualitative description of fiber reinforced concretes when we talk about the properties of concrete in terms of structural design and so on. Now, we have talked about this before if the fiber concrete is basically a combination of the concrete itself with some fibers the properties of the composite will depend upon the concrete and the properties of the fibers. The shape size content of steel fibers now we are talking about steel fiber reinforced concrete that is one of the most commonly used forms of fibers. Steel is one of the most commonly used materials as far as short fibers is concerned and therefore, steel fiber reinforced concrete is perhaps one of the most economical among the fiber concretes which is commercially used. So, the shape size and content of steel fibers is determined according to the required strength and deformation characteristics of the SFRC. So, it is one of those composites now or is fiber reinforced concrete now becomes one of those materials whose properties can be actually engineered that is we require a certain strength and a certain deformation characteristic 
and depending on these we choose the shape size or the content of the steel fiber. Now, these steel fibers are mixed either in the mixer with other materials or they are sprayed or added at the end in the agitator truck. So, it really is a matter of choice and engineers need to decide what they want to do depending on the site conditions that either the fibers can be mixed in the mixer itself along with other ingredients aggregate cement water and so on or we can mix the concrete in the mixer and then add the fibers later on in the agitator truck as it is being moved. Now, as far as the shape and size is concerned we know that the length ranges between 20 and 60 mm the diameters range from 0.3 to about 0.9 mm the aspect ratio ranges from about 30 to about 100 the fiber content ranges from about 0.5 to 2 percent by volume that is the normal range that is used among the fiber reinforced concretes and that translates to an equivalent of about 40 to 160 kgs per cubic meter by weight as far as fibers are concerned in concrete. This slide again has some more discussion related to steel fibers for concrete reinforcement they could be sheared fibers, cut fibers, machined fibers and having a certain dimension in terms of 0.5 and 0.5 which is the diameter or the size of the fiber in terms of the cross section and varying from 25 mm to about say 60 mm in length. And the most popular form of fibers for structural use is steel and glass fibers are generally used for non structural applications concrete pavements, short crete repair and concrete products these are some of the target applications. Now, these are pictures of machine fibers and the process that we get them from this here is cut wires and you will notice these edges where there are indentations to increase the bond and we have sheared fibers which again have surface some irregularity on the surface again to promote bond. Now, this here shows how the cracking load ratio changes as the fiber content. Now, what is the cracking load ratio? The cracking load ratio is the load at which the cracking takes place in a flexural the cracking takes place or the flexural cracking takes place as the load is applied. Taking the non fiber reinforced concrete as the base how much does this load change as the fiber content is increased. So, as we can see that that increase is more or less linear as far as steel fibers is concerned. Now, this slide here shows the tensile stress strain relationship for steel fiber concretes or steel fiber reinforced concretes and we can see that as far as the stress strain relationships are concerned the post cracking. So, if the cracking takes place at these points at these levels of strain and these levels of the load post cracking the load carrying capacity is much higher in the case of fiber reinforced concretes and as we increase the fiber content we get more and more load carrying capacity or the residual load carrying capacity beyond the failure stress. Indeed the actual variation as far as the stress strain curve is concerned would depend on the type of fiber that is used the length the aspect ratio and so on and so forth. Now, coming to the properties of steel fiber reinforced concrete once again the steel fibers may be assumed to carry the stresses only after cracking of the concrete and thus the tensile strength of steel fiber reinforced concrete may be taken to be the cracking or the tensile strength of the matrix concrete itself and it is only beyond that that the fibers come into play. Addition of fibers therefore, may not lead to substantial increase in the compressive or the tensile strength though the post cracking behavior is a completely different story as we have seen in the previous slides that it is not so much the change in the cracking load, but the post cracking load ability to continue to resist deformation. Whereas, flexural and bond strength is and especially the toughness 
of steel fiber concrete increases as the fiber content increases the compressive and tensile strengths do not change much with the fiber content and the fibers obviously come into play only after the matrix has cracked and these terms toughness is something which we need to define precisely and we will do that in the next few slides. Obviously, the strength of the concrete as far as water cement ratio and so on is concerned that theory or that understanding remains the same and therefore, the compressive strength itself that is the maximum load carrying capacity that does not really change even if the steel is reinforced with short fibers. This picture essentially shows the deflection measurement of steel fiber reinforced beams for the evaluation of toughness and as far as performance criteria is concerned we can have some of these terms that is the total toughness, toughness ratio, equivalent flexural strength and the residual flexural strength ratio which is used. So, the total toughness really refers to this area under the load deformation curve measured up to a certain point or up to a certain level of the deformation or deflection. Compared to this for the same graph or for the same load deflection graph the toughness ratio is a ratio of this area here to the ratio which is defined or to the area which is defined by a rectangle enclosing P max and delta naught. Equivalent flexural strength is nothing but this value here which is defined in terms of this area being equal to this rectangular the area enclosed by this rectangle being equal to the area actually under the load deflection curve. And similarly, we can define the residual flexural strength ratio in terms of a cyclic loading being a we can define the residual flexural strength ratio when we carry out a cyclic test that is we take it to a certain level peak load bring it down and the next time we take the load at what point does it start reducing that is what is the ratio we are talking about the P naught or the P 0 divided by the P max where P max is the maximum load sustained in the first cycle. So, these are some of the terms that a designer would be more interested to know when he is carrying out the design of a steel fiber reinforced concrete beam or any other element or member. As I have mentioned before the load deflection curves that we are talking about and which are at the center of our discussion in terms of the properties of fiber concretes are concerned these would depend on the volumes of fibers. For example, this here is a variation if we vary the volume from 0 to say 2 percent or for the different kinds of fibers. So, there are these five kinds of fibers which have been used and the area under the load deflection curve as measured up to any level of deformation here or deflection depends on the type of fiber or the nature of fiber that is used. So, it is really a combination of the nature of fiber as well as the fiber content that determines the toughness which is defined in terms of the area under the load deflection curve measured up to a certain predetermined point of the deflection. This slide here is an extension of steel fiber reinforced concrete being used in a normally reinforced beam. So, these steel beams have normal reinforcement that is if you have a cross section we have normal reinforcement here. Whereas, in the case of a fiber reinforced steel beam in addition to the normal reinforcement present in the beam the concrete itself is steel fiber reinforced. In this case the concrete is plain concrete the amount of reinforcement that is here which is actually the reinforcement to the beam is constant or is, is, is the same. So, if we look at the failure patterns or the ways in which these two beams have failed 
the steel fiber reinforced concrete has a much higher shear capacity compared to the plain concrete and as far as this beam is concerned it really does not even fail here we have a failure in shear which is not something which we see in the concrete made with steel fiber reinforced concrete. This picture here is an extension from what we saw if we look at the moment carrying capacity versus the a by d ratio. Now, the a by d ratio is the ratio which defines the span to the depth, the depth of the beam and the span that we are testing. So, as the span is increase as the a by d is increased we know from our understanding of reinforced concrete structures that there is a certain dip here where the shear is really predominating and therefore, very often the a by d is as far as normal reinforced concrete beams are concerned are required to be higher than a certain number. So, that we can ensure proper flexural behavior and we do not expect shear failures. Now, when it comes to steel fiber reinforced concrete beams whether it is cut wire or it is sheared fibers this dip that we have at an a by d of say 2.5 or something is not really seen. So, the moment carrying capacity really remains the same that is the concrete is not failing and it is only really the main reinforcement which is governing the capacity of the beam and that is the way it should be as far as reinforced concrete beams are concerned. Now, this picture here shows the elements of design of a steel fiber reinforced concrete flexural member where the top part is concrete and we have a variation of strain, stress and so on and on the tensile side we have the force being taken only by the main reinforcement. Now, in the case of a steel fiber reinforced concrete beam this part here is definitely not 0 that is the capacity in concrete as far as its ability to carry tensile loads is concerned is not 0 and that is what changes the behavior of the SFRC beam completely as we have seen in a sample in the previous slides and that is something which the designer needs to know when he calculates the capacities and designs those beams. So, the net tensile force for example, in this case in the case of a steel fiber reinforced concrete beam is acting at a level which is slightly higher than the location of the reinforcing bars and by how much higher would depend on what is the total tensile load that the concrete is carrying. So, these two together decide what the so called moment arm will be. So, those of you who have a better understanding of the design of normal concrete structures or the design of concrete structures using normal concrete and have studied the flexural design or the design of beams would appreciate some of these points a little better. Now, let us come to some of the engineering properties of concrete and how they change as far as the presence of fibers is concerned. So, for the same consistency in cement content, water content and S by A they need to be increased, the water needs to be increased, the cement content therefore goes up and the S by A goes up. Now, S by A going up we know basically means the mortar content goes up and that is something which we need to have in order for the mortar phase to be able to support the additional burden of the presence of fibers in the matrix. The presence of fibers tends to hamper the mixing, transportation, placing and consolidation and that is something which we need to take into account when we are designing the concrete itself and also the concrete structures. So, the coefficient of variation as far as compressive strength may be taken to be the same because that really does not change. The flexural bond strength and toughness of the steel fiber reinforced concrete increases as the fiber content increases 
and there is not much change which needs to be taken into account as far as the designer is concerned in terms of the compressive and tensile strengths. As far as considerations for fiber length is concerned we have already gone through that and we know that they should be sufficiently long compared to the maximum aggregate side to have the desired effect. If the fibers are short their effect on the workability is smaller and that is something which we would intuitively know. We already said that the fiber should be 1.5 times the maximum size of the aggregates and a 6 30 to 60 mm size as far as the length is concerned and in case the fibers exceed 30 to 40 mm special care needs to be taken in terms of proportioning the method of mixing transportation and so on is concerned to ensure that there is no formation of fiber balls and that is something which we will see in a later slide. As far as proportioning of fiber reinforced concretes as far as steel fiber reinforced concrete is concerned we should keep the water content to a minimum for, but we should remember that each fiber content entails or requires that the water be increased by about 20 kgs per cubic meter. So, if you are working with a water content of about say 165 or 170 kgs per cubic meter of water if we add some fiber to it it might go up by about 20 kgs and we might land up with a water content of 185 190 for a 1 percent fiber in the concrete matrix. So, far as the fibers are between 0.5 and 2 percent we need not bother about any special mixing method. And since the addition of fibers increases the water content it is prudent to try to use water reducing admixtures or high range water reducing admixtures in order to control that increase in the water content. We might like to increase the super plasticizer dosage, so that we do not have to increase the water content and yet get the same amount of workability in a fiber reinforced concrete. I have already mentioned that for the workability in fiber reinforced concretes the sand aggregate ratio needs to be increased that is we need a basically higher amount of mortar in the system. The shape size and content of steel fiber contents may be determined considering the strength and deformation that is required. A steel fiber reinforced concrete can be proportioned much in the same manner as we did with normal concretes and keeping in view that is that is keeping in view things like workability and strength and seeing how much is the initial water demand. But we must remember that high unit water content and the sand aggregate ratio could induce bleeding and segregation in the concrete and also hamper the mixing transportation placing and consolidation and these are things which we need to address when we try to talk in terms of proportioning of steel fiber reinforced concrete or a fiber reinforced concrete in general. As far as mixing and transportation is concerned of course, the first thing to remember is that the mix should be thoroughly homogeneous the mixing process should be such that we do not have fibers just in one place or the other. However, we need an increased energy to mix the fiber reinforced concrete because the fibers add to the extent of energy that is required. So, the energy demand as far as mixing is concerned increases in fact, it could be 2 to 4 times the energy required for normal concrete and therefore, we may need to have force action batched mixers instead of gravity mixers the time of mixing may have to be increased and so on and that needs to be determined experimentally depending on the type of fiber that we are using. And we have already talked in terms of the addition of fibers through dispensers and so on. We should also make sure that when fibers are added in an agitating truck the concrete should be mixed at high speeds to ensure proper dispersion of the fiber and its distribution throughout the concrete mass. And as far as the balling is concerned we have already talked about it and we will see later on. It may also be remembered that the pumping loads are greater than those for normal concretes and therefore, the pipe layout that we use when we are pumping concrete from one place to another needs to be appropriately designed the bends and so on need to take into account the fact that the concrete may not flow that easily or it will require additional pumping effort. 
flexible pipe sections could be particularly vulnerable to abrasion because of the presence of fibers within the concrete. What we are saying is that if we have a pipe and if concrete is flowing through this, if fibers are present in the concrete then they could cause abrasion, then they could cause abrasion in the lining of the flexible pipe and therefore that is something which one and therefore that is something which the engineer needs to keep in mind the diameter, the material, the pipe thickness and so on of the pipes used in a pumping operation should be carefully chosen. This here is a picture of the fiber balling in the case of steel fiber concretes. So, we see that these are the kind of balls that the fibers may form unless precautions are taken to disperse the fibers throughout the concrete matrix. So, reviewing the properties towards the closure of the discussion, improved properties in terms of tension, flexure and shear, improved crack resistance, ductility and impact, high crack arresting capability reduces the crack width and improves fatigue strength of the concrete, higher compressive toughness at compressive failure and high flexural toughness at bending indicates its high resistance to impact and explosive loads. These here are some of the useful references for fiber reinforced concrete and of course, we can continue our discussion. This list is by no means exhaustive and a lot of published literature is available as far as fiber reinforced concretes are concerned. And before we close the discussion for the day, let us try to see what we need to do additionally in order to understand some of the concepts in fiber reinforced concrete systems that we studied today. First thing obviously, is to study some of the fibers used in fiber reinforced concretes. Even though we saw some of the fibers today, that is not exhaustive. There are different companies which manufacture the fibers, the fibers vary in their length, their diameter, the material itself and so on. We could study some real applications of fiber reinforced concrete from the point of view of mixed proportions, properties etcetera. We have talked in terms of the effect of uh, fiber addition in terms of workability, toughness and so on. There is a lot of published information which tells us quantitative details as to how much fiber addition leads to what kind of an improvement or what is the quantitative scale of improvement in terms of toughness increase in the cracking load and so on. Then there are of course, codes which often give empirical formulae for estimating properties such as the tensile and the flexural strength. What we could try to do is to see if the codes what the codes say about whether the same equations or the same estimating methods can be used in the case of fiber reinforced concretes or there is a difference for the case of fiber reinforced concretes. And of course, what are the available codes and specifications that can be used as references. Some of them we try to see as far as Japan is concerned, there are others in the US and Europe which help us design fiber reinforced concrete structures and a comparison of the provisions there could be very helpful. I would like to acknowledge my thanks to the JSCE publications which I have used in the public in my discussion today and of course, the permission that I have for using materials by Professor Omoto of the Public Works Research Institute to use that material in the discussion today with the course. And with that, we come to an end of the discussion today. Thank you.